they'll think it's a con. <laughs> well, here we are. As usual, after the late night news, as you just saw. Honestly, I'm beginning to feel like the warm-up man for TVAM, me. This programme is now so late that I actually deliver the papers that slag me off. <laughs> yeah, that's an armful, let me tell you. It's really strange being put out the same time as my cat. <laughs> and having the same problem as well, but I don't know, you don't know about <laughs> On to the brighter side as we look ahead into the 1990s. It was Martin Luther King who said, I have a dream. Well, we all have dreams. Tory MPs have wet ones. <laughs> My dream for the new decade is to see an ad lib on blind date. <laughs> right or not? Yeah. Come on, it's done here. We might as well tell them. <laughs> now, I blame the producers who think we're all idiots who believe those poor buggers work those cringingly embarrassing answers out for themselves. <laughs> you know what I mean, eh? This question is for number one. Number one. I'm a waiter in a restaurant, and you attract my attention. What would you say? Number one says, To fall for me would be a piece of cake. <laughs> because with me on your menu, you'll be coming back for seconds. <laughs> They've never asked me to contribute, you know. Can you imagine me writing for Blind Date? Number one, I'm a waiter. How can I best serve you? Answer? By giving me a large portion every night. <laughs> now, the next thing I'd have to change, and I'm sorry about this, it's Scylla Black's excruciating wriggle at the start of the show. <laughs> Anyone know what I'm talking about? Yes. Now, I mean, it's bad enough Fatima Whitbread making us all turn red and look the other way when she does it, and <laughs> Scylla getting on the act as well. And it's funny how certain things make you cringe with embarrassment. Now, I only talk about ITV programmes, right? Because I've done a deal with the BBC. <laughs> they don't have me on any of their shows, and I don't buy their licence. Sorry, that sounds fair enough to me. <laughs> Do you know what else makes me cringe on telly? I'm sure you're the same. Bruce Forsyth's rap on You Bet. <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> Do you want to bet on it? No. You bet. <laughs> no, it's no thank you very much. <laughs> Do you want to bet on it? And what's with all this pressing Bruce's button for a four-size family flutter? <laughs> and then Bruce's button ears control the fate of Forsyth in the form of a forfeit. Why don't he speak bleeding English? We all know who he is. He don't need to keep reminding us, does he? Well, we all make idiots of ourselves at times, I suppose. We don't need Bruce's buttons to do it either. For example, now the fellas will know this. There's nothing worse, right, than going into a toilet of a restaurant or a pub. You know what I'm going to say. Washing your hands and discovering the taps have minds of their own. <laughs> and you splash yourself all down the front of your trousers. We've done it, haven't we, lads? Yeah. And you walk out with a big, dark stain in an awkward place. Down here. <laughs> well, I hope Julian Clare is watching. He would have loved that bit anyway. <laughs> happens when you've got light-coloured trousers on as if the taps know. They do, they know. Black trousers, taps are as good as gold. Light trousers, bush, water everywhere. They know. <laughs> so you're standing there with water gushing down your inside leg. Now you flap your trousers, right? Now you've done this in the wind to try and dry them out. Like... <laughs> and someone comes in and says, oh, two hands, that's not bad. <laughs> is an edit, if ever I heard one in my life. <laughs> You got through a whole box of swan vestas. Tried that one. <laughs> and then you look round for help, and all you can find is eyes all toilet paper. <laughs> Do you remember eyes all toilet paper? Yeah. The worst paper in the world if you're into origami. <laughs> it's about as much good as a luncheon voucher to an anorexic, that is. <laughs> but it's your lucky night, because in the corner next to the chocolate machine. <laughs> And buy them, they taste like rubber and things. <laughs> the answer to all your problems. <laughs> Stick to the script, I just. A warm air dryer. But your problems have only just started. I know what you're thinking. Wouldn't it be easier just to go back out into the restaurant and shout at the top of your voice, I haven't pissed myself on it, I was only washing my hands. <laughs> but no, you, you won't be beaten, you see. But where have they stuck that dryer? Halfway up the bloody wall with the dead spiders. 
Why? I mean, who washes their face when they've had a slash? I don't. <laughs> Never have. <laughs> so there you stand. <laughs> First on one leg, right? <laughs> then you have to get on tiptoe, because you... Still no choice. So then you're climbing on the wash basins, right? <laughs> Wobbling around at altitude. Now, with me, guaranteed, this is the moment when someone walks in and says, It's you, innit? <laughs> oh, I know you. you you're, hey, you're. Hey? How's old Nick Nick then? It's you, innit? Hey? <laughs> so there I am, trying to dry my trousers, but poaching my privates at the same time, and he comes out with a line like, Ooh, you're a lot bigger than you look on television. <laughs> It's probably least embarrassing to throw your trousers away and walk back into the restaurant in your pants like Oliver Reed does, you know? <laughs> I'll tell you what used to embarrass me, and I'm sure it did you too, trying to buy something rather personal in a shop. Now, the girls have their own problems, we all know that, but we're talking fellas now, particularly a chemist shop. Do you remember those days? I'll jog your memory. A while ago, when just a lad, I had a girlfriend, name of Glad. I told her, Glad, for you, I'll die. She said, fair enough. Goodbye. <laughs> Do you know, I'd have married Glad, no lie. And once thought I might have to. Now, <laughs> I'll tell you how it came about, the time we spent three months in doubt. On second thoughts, I'd rather not, because Gladys never laughed a lot, and if she hears this, she'll have me shot. But once, she rang me up. She said, it's Gladys. Want to come on round? Her whispering tones were a welcome sound. So I put the phone down, I punched the air, ironed some jeans and washed my hair. And to get some fags and things to wear to the shop, so I duly stumbled. Now, the chemist was first port of call to get a packet of... <laughs> to buy a pack of cotton wool. <laughs> no, not quite what I had in mind. But when I saw the queue behind and the chemist leering, like, most unkind, my words got sort of jumbled. That chemist, what can I say? I still relive that awful day. My mouth went dry, my legs went weak. I saw them up there, but I couldn't speak. <laughs> they were up there on the shelf, but squeak. <laughs> the words just wouldn't come. There they were, but I couldn't ask. Then I drummed up courage, bought a flask. Razor blades, shaving foam, some lucasade, a plastic comb. <laughs> what I needed most, I left alone. The chemist knew, but he wouldn't help me. <laughs> all he did was take the piss. <laughs> have one of these, and oh, you must have this. There were people waiting in the queue. I didn't know what the hell to do. It, he just took the rise. And I knew he knew. He knew what I was after. I left the chemist shop incensed. I'd spent ten pounds and fifteen pence. <laughs> all that cash I'd gone and spent, all because me bottle went. <coughs> Bastard, he knew what I meant. <laughs> Ten pounds, fifteen pence. I'd nothing left to get the wine. And I was quickly running out of time. Round to Glad's, I sprinted hard. I felt more nervous with each yard. I knocked politely on me guard. Her mother smiled and said, You must be Richard. Oh, you're a lot bigger than you look... No, they didn't. You must be Richard. Come on in. Glad's upstairs. Oh, she's in a spin. You're all she ever talks about. Me and Jack, we're going out. You'll be wanting time alone, no doubt. Sit down, I'll go and get her. I'm sure her mother sort of knew what Glad and I were going to do. The couch looked bouncy, very strong. Not only that, it was very long. There weren't one thing that could go wrong. Famous last words there. The door creaked open, in came Glad. Richard, this is Jack, my dad. Pleased to meet you, son, he said. He was six foot six from toe to head. <laughs> We're off ballroom dancing, her old man said. Perhaps you'd like to join us. Oh, yes. I really, really would. <laughs> he looked and with a nod said, good. Gladys, go and get your coat. She swore at me. <laughs> Slapped my throat. <laughs> what she said, I cannot quote. But she gave me such a mouthful. What's this ballroom dancing, eh? I wanted both of them away. I thought we'd turn the lights down low and have a bit of, well, you know, a bit of, you know what I mean, a bit of how's your father? Well, that's the trouble. 
I told Glad. My father's fine, but it's your dad. What's wrong with him? She began to shout. It was you who said we'd both go out. Richard, what's this all about? I said, how long has he been a chemist? <laughs> Old as the eels, old gag and all that. Makes a change in rhyme, though, doesn't it? I learned that off Pam Ayers. She was pissed on that. <laughs> Back in a couple of minutes with some guests. We've got impressionist Mike Osmond, master magician John Simonet, and, of course, live on stage, status quo. So, uh, put some things in your luggles, put the kettle on, and see you in a couple of minutes. Cheers. shape of body form. You can trust it even on your heaviest days. Mark is about to find out that at the same time he's washing his hair, he can also condition it. With Dimension, a shampoo and conditioner, two in one. Dimension, a shampoo and conditioner in one handy bottle. I've discovered a new way of making a feast of my fish. Take a tasty cheese sauce, sandwich it between prime white fish fillet and crunchy crumb, and there you have it. Bird's eye fish feast. A feast of a dish from the captain's table. Maria, I have something to ask you. Maria, who are you? The Italian's most extravagant gestures are always accompanied by... Will you? The most extravagant dessert. Wall's Romanza is a sumptuous combination of vanilla ice cream, chocolate toffee pieces, and rich golden biscuit. Yes. Romanza. The extravaganza. For whiter teeth and a nicer smile, Pearl Drops, and now Pearl Drops Smokers. Beauty treatment for teeth. This Sunday, in the news of the world... Trace and me... And James and I... ...transformed two identical houses with very different results. We done it like this. We did it like this. In Your Home, a four-part DIY guide with page after page of decorating and furnishing ideas. Plus, win £100,000 cash to buy or turn your own house into a dream home. And everyone can get two months' home contents insurance absolutely free. It's all in Sunday Magazine, free with the news of the world this Sunday. When Harry met Sally, the number one box office smash. Hilarious, you'll love it. Released on video May 3rd. Someone. Oh, what I mean is me and mine. What are you doing on the weekend? So what you 
Uh, you obviously recognise my two mates from The Bachelors, Francis Rossi and <laughs> Rick Parfit, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. You're right with that, Rick, for a minute? Yeah, thank you. I'm going to be a couple of people in the audience now. Come along with me. Hi, Bye, gents. <laughs> now, this is a bit of the programme that I like, because uh, over previous Abercadines, as you know, we've gone into the audience and found unsuspecting members of the public. Remember the sewer man? Hey, <laughs> 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 The Prime Minister's uh, sewer man. He used to clear up what she spoke. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Well, you see, people, when they sort of bump into me when I'm curb crawling and soliciting around Soho, <laughs> yeah, people always say to me, is it a wind-up? Do you know who's in your audience? Are they plants or are they just members of the audience? Well, it's for you to work it out. Uh, obviously, you know, now, you know me, I do come clean. Now, we do put plants in the audience. I'll be honest, there's one there, look, cactus. <laughs> Because he hasn't been watered for a while, do you know what I mean? <laughs> but uh, we'll move over to, to this gentleman here, and uh, he isn't actually a plant at all. He's my first guest on the show, ladies and gentlemen. Would you welcome master magician John Simonet? Now, John, um, you've obviously. Uh, we're good mates and all that. We might as well tell the people this. He comes around my house, you know. When I have parties, he comes around and does close-up magic when everyone's pissed. Now, <laughs> so when you've had a few, you think he's great, but now we're going to... And he can make a bottle of whiskey disappear, just like that. <laughs> <laughs> but we brought you down here to do some real tricks for us, right? So, yep. now, you used to be a... What did you used to be before you was a semi-pro magician? Well, I tell everybody I was a financial consultant, uh, Richard. It's not actually yeah. true, but that's what I tell them, in fact. Then do a fiver. Then do a fiver. Well, I haven't got that much with me tonight, Richard, but I can lend you a bit of paper. Yep. Could you just feel that for me? Just a piece of paper, Richard. Go ahead. Yep. Just oh the my, paper. Nothing oh, else. my goody aunt, it is. <laughs> Richard, the thing is this. Wouldn't it be great to go down the pub with a piece of paper like this, fold it up, make a wish, and when the barman got there, you unfolded it, and it was a £20 note. What do you reckon? Richard, I'm glad they like that because it's all downhill from now. Because everyone says, John, if you're that good, why don't you do a 50? Well, to be honest, I wish I could do a 50, Richard. But when I fold them up and hope for 50s, I just end up what I started with. I always wish I'd spent the 20, in fact, because I end up with a blank piece of paper. Brilliant stuff, I love it. While you're here, come on, do some real magic for us. Come on, I know the sort of stuff you do because you've done it Fine. thousands of times with me and all that sort of okay. If I get you some volunteers, right, some answers, how many do you want? About four. I won't pick them. They'll all think they're with me. So if you grab four, I'll, grab I'll see four. you down on the stage. You go down on the stage. Give a round of applause, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So if I can get this right, it's Anne and Ted, is that okay? And Linda and Mark, yeah. great, thanks very much for coming to help me. And what I'd like to do before I start is to ask you a question, Anne. Now, be honest, do you ever read the TV Times? Now, before you answer, just remember where you are, Anne. <laughs> do you? No. You don't. <laughs> <laughs> Not very diplomatic, are you, Anne? Not looking for a career in politics, are you? No. It's a pity, I think there's a vacancy coming up soon that you might be able to get. <laughs> 
actually, I'd like to show you something, Anne, that will help you read the TV Times in future. Because I've got an idea for a new format for the TV Times. And people at home will actually recognise this as last week's TV Times. And what I've done is to take the cover and to cut it up into these little bits of paper. It's a new idea for what to do with it when you've finished reading it. No, it's not what you're thinking, madam. <laughs> what you do is this. You fold them in half, take them down to the pub, wave them in the air, and all your friends come running, because you end up with a handful of ten-pound notes. What do you reckon, Anne? <clears throat> well, you'll be delighted to know, Ted, that I've been authorised to give these away as souvenirs. I thought you might. <laughs> Actually, we give them away, Ted, every other week, and I've got some bad news for you. You've guessed, haven't you? Yes, I'm afraid this is not the other week. Ted, take that, Ted, have a look at it, please. Make sure it is actually a real one. It's got the watermark, it's got everything, OK? Now, there is, of course, a slight problem, Ted, because uh, we found when we gave these away in rehearsals... Let's just have that one back. I didn't think I was going to get it back there, Ted. Thanks a lot. <laughs> this is the problem we found. We found everybody went down to the pub and they bought everybody a drink. Ted, you'd do that, wouldn't you? You had to think about that, Ted. Well, when you buy it, <laughs> mine's a pint. The problem is this, Ted, we found everybody folded them in half and they snapped their fingers for the barman, which is very rude. And when he got there, Ted, you had to tell him what he should be watching on the TV Times, which I think is not a bad idea myself. What do you think? <clears throat> Thank you. Well, we'd better close this spot before it festers, and what I'd like to do for you next is a card trick. Now, most magicians do card tricks, so I thought I'd do a card trick for you. Um, now, a lot of people say card tricks, you know, are long, complicated and boring. But I'd like to assure you all that this one is no exception. <laughs> Just as bad as all the others. What we've got here, of course, a pack of cards, all different. Let me show you the camera there. All different, just like you'd find on any night shift. What I'd like you to do for me, Mark, is to take the cards and shuffle them. Thanks very much. I'll pick them up, don't worry. <laughs> but try not to disturb the order I've put them in. Oh, you have done, that's great. Well, we'll do a different trick there, never mind. OK, let's have the cards back. If I can just show you them, they're all different, right? And what I want you to do for me, Anne, is to remove a card, a number card. We'll do it face up so you can see the one you're getting. Take a number card from the pack, one with a number on it, any one you like, as long as it's tonight. That's great. What have you got there? A five of diamonds. Anne, I'm going to give you a pen. I'd like you to place the card on the table down here for me. Thanks very much. And could you draw me a little picture on the card? Anything you like. Use your imagination, Anne, but keep it clean. Little drawing, yes, what have we got there? Something cheerful, little man, he's got his hands up, fine. He's doing the splits, is that a gymnast there, is it? Fine. And could you sign it here, please? Nice and big, with a flourish. Excellent. And telephone number? No, that's a different trick. OK, and if I can just point out, you've signed this with a permanent marker. It says so on the pen. Well, it used to, but it's got rubbed off now. Um, <laughs> Of course, having signed it, we now have a marked card in the pack. We'll just wave it around till it dries. And we're going to place the card on the top of the pack like so, and then we mix the cards around. Watch this. We shuffle the pack by cutting it lots of times. In fact, I shall shuffle them until you say stop. Any time? Oh, brilliant. Thanks very much. <laughs> well, like a lady, you can say stop in time. That's the trouble. <laughs> so what we're going to do is this. We cut the pack at this point, and the idea is to cut at the right card. Now then, the top card is, of course... The Three of Hearts, which is the right card. You were expecting the other one, weren't you? What I'd like you to do, Ted, is to take the three for me, hold on to it, and I want you to place it into the pack wherever you like. Just hold it like that and plunge it into the pack. There you go, anywhere you like. Hold on tight, Ted, don't let go. Ted, I hope you haven't let me down. We have found the right card. Look at this. It's not here or here. Oh, dear. It may not have worked, but, Ted, could you turn the card you're holding over? Yes, it is the Five of Diamonds. That's good news today. Well, we shall shuffle them again because, Mark, now it's your turn. Obviously, the easy way to find the card is to look for the one with the name on. That's too easy for a man of Mark's ability. Mark, what I want you to do is this. I shall flick through the cards, and I want you to stick your finger... Let me finish the sentence. <laughs> ..into the pack anywhere you like. OK, Mark? Anytime you feel like it. Brilliant. Let's have a look. Close, but not close enough. Hold your hand flat for me, Mark. Brilliant. Bring it near the centre of the table and hold it nine inches above the tabletop. Great. If that's nine inches, I've got no problem. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, if that's the right card, the one you signed, that's pretty good. Wouldn't you say, say so? Trouble is, if it's wrong, we are in trouble. Notice I said we, Mark. <laughs> if it's the wrong one, Anne gets the contents of my wallet and Mark's for getting it wrong. 
I should have told him he was in on this, you know. I'll leave the wallet on the table here. Right, the card was a five, you signed it on the face, here we go. Yes! Mark has found a five and he's done better. He's changed it to a seven and rubbed your name off. How about that? <laughs> I'm impressed, I can tell. Thank you, Mark. You've done enough damage for one day. OK, well, if we spread the cards out like this, you'll realise, of course, that there isn't actually a signed card in the pack anymore. OK, let's have a look through. Definitely not. Here's the wallet on the table. You do get the contents, Anne. It's not a lot in here. It's a Magic Circle membership card. That'll have to go back now, I'm afraid, Mark. There's the TV Times. There's a business card. You do actually get the contents, though. The contents is a small envelope which is sealed up. Before I open it, I'd just like to thank my four volunteers for being very brave and coming out to help me tonight. Because, you see, this is my insurance against card tricks going wrong. Inside the sealed envelope is a playing card. It's a five of diamonds, but it's not just any five of diamonds. This is the one that Anne signed. Thank goodness for that. OK. Thank you. John Simonet, ladies and gentlemen. Quite right, should turn pro, that's what I've been saying for ages. Isn't it strange how people consider themselves more health conscious these days? What about you lot? Do you feel pretty fit? Uh, you don't look it either. <laughs> uh, I don't know about you, but we were always health conscious in our family. I had cod liver oil. <laughs> Do you remember cod liver oil? Every single morning for seven years. And seven years worth is a lot of oil from a cod's liver, let me tell you. <laughs> even gallons of the stuff. Mind you, a lot of good it did me. All them cods in us, I still can't even swim. <laughs> and then my dad used to make me suffer a spoonful of linseed oil every morning so I wouldn't crack when I played cricket. <laughs> Cheers. See you on tour. <laughs> the thing these days, of course, is royal jelly. Heard of it? Yeah. Anyone on it? No! You liars, you've got to be. There's thousands of them. Have you seen all the ads in the colour supplements? Hundreds of them. Mind you, they're no good if you're really, 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 really ill, because it says on the ad, allow 28 days for delivery. <laughs> and you stuff it by the time they arrive. <laughs> a capsule containing the goodness of a queen bee, that's what it is, to be taken at night with a cup of hot chocolate. Why not have a crunchy? <laughs> Same thing, isn't it? Same thing. <laughs> Royal jelly is supposed to make you look 20 years younger. Can you imagine what Barbara Cartman would look like if she stopped taking it? <laughs> <laughs> now, the Royals, as you probably know, are heavily into health foods and indeed contributed a great deal towards the rising popularity of eating strange things. Many have wondered for a few years now what Prince Charlie actually says to the plants he talks to. We now know. I'm going to eat you. <laughs> This royal jelly jollop ensures a long and healthy life. Oh, yeah? Why is it, then, that bees only live for four years? <laughs> Forget all this four-year crap. Bring on the giant tortoise tablets. That's what I say. <laughs> I can handle living with a shell on me back if it's forever. <laughs> Do you know, oh, it's a thought, isn't it? In the, in the four years of a queen bee's life, they lay one egg every single minute of their lives, 24 hours a day. Did you know that? It's a fact. Just think, that's another little bee on the earth every single minute of every single day. <laughs> Which explains why the two things that queen bees hate most in life are hemorrhoids <laughs> and christenings. <laughs> so who wants to be healthy anyway? That only means you live longer. The longer you live, the more bills you have to pay. So what's the point? This is the key to life for me. Get up in the morning, smoke 20 Craven A full strength with your glass of scotch while eating a bread and dripping sandwich covered with fresh cream and cigar. <laughs> Have a Chinese for lunch, a plate of tripe and beef burgers before going to the pub for 10 pints of better, a large pork pie with pickled eggs, pork scratchings, and on the way home, pebble down 15 counsellors, it's going to be a drink. What about this poll tax then? <laughs> she knows, it doesn't matter. I've kept mine very low. I've slung the old woman out. <laughs> but honestly, is it an unmitigated disaster or what? Yes. Do we want it? No. Oh, she's bleeding watching this. She watched the last one, I know, because she wrote and told me. I'm one of the thousands <laughs> who is much more worse off by paying poll tax as opposed to when it was just rates. In fact, I'm a lot worse off. Well, I never used to pay me rates. <laughs> but it's all out of proportion, and it? Take the royals again. 
Fergie's poll tax for her new mansion becomes exactly the same as a tiny terraced house down the road. Ten grand. It's not fair, is it? <laughs> That's because the poll tax is on people and not on property. Which, in her case, is fair enough, because she's never bleeding home anyway, is she? <laughs> what did she call her first kid, what was it? Beatrice, wasn't it? That poor little bee, been separated from her mother for so long now, she's just written to Cilla Black to go on surprise, surprise. <laughs> Mrs Thatcher still thinks she'll win the next election. All I can say is I wish I was her bookie. <laughs> because believe me, Margaret, if you're tuned in, there's more chance of Desert Orchid winning the boat race. <laughs> <laughs> or you lot falling asleep while status quo are on. Now, you won't find out, actually, because they're too loud for in here. I'm not going to have any of that. We want folk in here. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so here's a little light music. For your pleasure, delight and delectation, the flight of the bumblebee.
What do you call someone who says no to pollution, third world poverty, and animal testing? These days, you call him a shrewd investor. Ask your breadhead about stewardship ethical investments or call Friends Provident free on 0800 300 399. Gonna take a sentimental journey Gonna set my heart at ease Gonna make a sentimental journey To a new... Special people deserve Cadbury's inspirations Four drawers of deliciously different chocolates Happiness is a cigar called Hamlet. The mild cigar. Can I help you, sir? The balance on my instant extra account, please. I'll just tap in your details. Instant Extra account, you'll enjoy instant access and from March the 1st, increased rates of interest. And we won't make a song and dance about it. You can squirt it out of strawberries, desserts and puddings too. No lesser cream will do. How much worse will the weather get? What will Britain be like in years to come? Read the Planet in Peril supplement in this Sunday's Observer. Now, I didn't really know what to talk about on this show. We've done all the, uh, you know, the topical stuff like poll tax and all that sort of nonsense. But I thought I'd tell you about how I actually got where I am now in, in television. Because I'm sure a lot of people, they sit at home saying, I wonder how he got on telly, you know. I'm sure a lot of people wonder how I got on telly. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, you know what I mean. Now, I actually started out um, as a draftsman. That's what I did when I left school. And uh, I sort of went downhill from there, really. The last proper job I had before I messed around doing this, and some of you in the audience here in London will, will know that I was actually a disc jockey on Capital Radio. Did you know this? No. <laughs> The great thing about these sort of shows is you can do them again, you see. So if I just say, can, and we take this out, do you remember me being a disc jockey on Capital Radio? Yes! yes. We leave that in now and we'll show everyone. <laughs> no, no, we're going to show you lot how stupid these Londoners are, right? <laughs> now, I remember, well, I used to live in Essex at the time, right up in North Essex, and it, I used to do the late show on Capital. And I used to sort of moonlight a little bit, you know, and do clubs on the way in and things, been sort of late on at midnight and so on. And there was one night in particular that I've always wanted to tell the story of on television, the, how it is, warts and all, right? <laughs> I was driving down the M11. Now, you know that dreaded moment when you look in your rearview mirror and you see Ekilop, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and I saw this. I must keep my hands still. I feel like bleeding Ronnie Corbett sitting here. <laughs> Ekilop, right? There it is. And I thought, oh, no, they're going to pull me. And fair enough. Now, <laughs> had a look. There they go. Pull up in the yard shoulder. About three miles up, we'll give the bus a bit of exercise. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> winds down the window, this young copper comes up to me. And it's funny, uh, I know other comedians say this, but the reason they do say it is because it's true that the older we all get, the younger coppers look. It's true though, isn't it? You can tell how old you're getting by how young coppers are. This geezer who stopped me was about 12. <laughs> he had a Rupert annual under his bleeding arm, and his mum with him like that. <laughs> He said, is this your car, sir? I said, no, I nicked it. Because <laughs> I love a bit of humour, me. 
fun. And if you're in a bit of a hole, humour often helps you out. I know it's not working tonight, but often it can <laughs> get you out of a bit of bother, you see. So he said, have you got an identification on you? I mean, me, have you got any identification? And I said, well, I don't wish to be sort of happy or anything, but don't you know who I am? And he said, well, he said, I can't help that, Mr. Brookin, he said. <laughs> you no, know, we played similar, I must admit. He said, if you haven't got identification, we'll make you go and sit in the back of the police car and come, and, and while we check out in Swansea and all that, make sure you're legit. So back I go into the police car, and I think I'm going to get done here. They don't like me because I've been lippy. They're going to throw the book at me. So I'm sitting in the back of the police car with this young rookie who's sitting there doing a Thomas the Tank Engine jigsaw puzzle. <laughs> And I thought, well, if I could get identification, I could prove I was uh, and be on my way. And at that point, I remembered in my car was an old animal alphabet book I did years and years and years ago, a little children's book. And on the back was a photo of me, you see. So I thought, if I could get to that book and the photo, I could prove I was and I'll be on my way. Drop them once, they're into that sort of thing. And I'd be, <laughs> and I'd be on my way. <laughs> so I said to this young cop, I said, excuse me, do you mind if I go to the toilet? And he said, no, go and off you go. So I went to the toilet, then I got out of the police car. Went... <laughs> Got the copy of the book, so he dropped me a copy and, and uh, got on, drove on my way, got to Capital Radio. Now, I was on air at 12 o'clock, midnight. I don't know if any of you have been past the Capital Radio building in London. It's just past Euston Station there. It's a massive, great glass, 29,000-storey skyscraper. <laughs> when I was on air between 12 and 4 o'clock, I was the only person in the building. <laughs> Every week for nearly six years. I was the only bloke in the building, apart from a security guard who was chatting up his bird on the phone. He didn't even know what was happening anyway. <laughs> One night, I fell asleep. As I say, I was the only bloke in the building, and I nodded off. Now, I'll try and describe it to you. You know when you're going along a motorway, and you're going, and you fall asleep, and you go, oh. <laughs> Christ, I went to sleep then. <laughs> and he went to sleep for a... Right. A million, trillion, billy, billy, billion of a second, right? <laughs> or a junction. Uh, <laughs> you know it's like that. You went, oh, dear. And you try and look for something as if, as if you haven't passed it. You know? <laughs> anyway, I'm playing this record by a brilliant Irish singer-songwriter called David McWilliams. He wasn't very, very well known. He had a hit years ago with a song called The Days of Pearly Spencer. But other than that, fairly, fairly unknown. I loved him. He had an album at the time called Wounded, and it was a brilliant album. And not only that, but the first track lasted 7 minutes, uh, 43 seconds, which was great, because I could whip out, have a piss, make a cup of tea, and come back. <laughs> while, while the record was playing this. <laughs> so, <clears throat> it was beneficial for all. <laughs> Problem was, as I say, I fell asleep. Now, I played the whole album by this bloke. <laughs> I did. I did, I did, honestly. Tracks by this geezer, David. He must have thought he was bleeding Christmas when he got his mortgage. Eight tracks by this bloke, right? Not only that, but with eight tracks, you've got seven gaps, right? You know, little gaps between the records. <laughs> now, them gaps, right, are four seconds long. Now, that may not seem a lot to you. I'll count you four seconds, right? We go. Well. That's four seconds. Now that, I know, is not a lot. But on radio, which they call dead air, of course, because there's nothing happening, it is a long time. Especially seven times. <laughs> Do you know what really pissed me off? No one noticed. And time now to introduce you to uh, a friend of mine and a friend of his who was with him as well. Uh, one of my best pals in show business, ladies and gentlemen. Would you welcome a brilliant impressionist, Mike Osman, with Frank Bruno. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, or as Richard would say, thank you very much. <laughs> yes, and in case you're wondering which is which, this is Frank Bruno and I'm Mike Osman. And as Frank's here, who better to interview him at ringside, David Coleman. Uh, absolutely remarkable. Uh, I don't believe it. Uh, I'm actually at ringside with Frank Bruno. Now, tell me, Frank, how's the fight going? Well, you know, Harry, I'm hitting him. <laughs> 
I'm hitting him with the old one numb. <laughs> the old one numb. One in the other one, anyway. Now, Frank, he hasn't laid a finger on you. Well, keep your eye on the referee, cos someone's knocking hell out of me. <laughs> Now, Frank, tell me, why did you lose your last fight? Well, it's my manager. You know my manager, Terry Lawless. <laughs> yeah. He told me, you know, he told me, he said, Frank, you mustn't lose your temper in the ring. You mustn't lose your temper. So remember, you know, the guy hit me. And I fell to the floor. And I thought, no, count to ten. <laughs> Well, now it's time for a question of sport. And on question of sport this evening, from boxing, Lloyd Hannigan. Lloyd, how are you feeling? I feel good. <laughs> you know, I feel good and everything and all that. <laughs> and I feel good. Moving on, we were talking about boxing a couple of minutes ago, and here's someone who looks like he's done ten rounds, Liverpool and England's Peter Beardsley. Peter, how are you? Uh, I see no, I see what I'm <laughs> <laughs> you. If we score more goals than the other side, obviously, I think we'll win. Oh, That's remarkable. It's remarkable, Frank. Now, now we're going to meet ex-champion jockey John Francom. And John, what we want you to do is study this piece of film, and at the end, we want you to tell us what happened next. So now, watch this. Yes, thank you. They're going down. Drawn one is Oliver Reed on the booze. <laughs> Two, Mrs. Thatcher on borrowed time. <laughs> Three is A.B. Goldberg carrying ten pounds, but to you four for cash. <laughs> Five is Terry Wogan on every night of the week. <laughs> Six is Pamela Bordes, a stride member of parliament. <laughs> so they're all installed, they're under starter's orders, and away they go. It's Pamela Bordes, a stride member of parliament, going pretty well now. She looks like she's enjoying this race, followed by Oliver Reed, who was on the booze, is now flat on his back. <laughs> Mrs. Thatcher is the first to go round the bend, and they're going at quite a gallop now. And as they go into the country, it's over to our man, Michael O'Hare. <laughs> John, what happened next? Well, I ain't got a clue. <laughs> I don't know a lot about racing. As everyone who's ever followed my tips will tell you. <laughs> because I've left the horses now. I've got a new job. I've started a new business. <laughs> I've just opened a sperm bank in London. <laughs> the first day was a disaster. <laughs> I had three customers. One came on the bus. <laughs> to miss the tube. <laughs> what? What, Frank? I oh, don't get that. <laughs> and tell me, Frank, can you do any impressions? Yeah, I'll do one. <laughs> and who's that? Bill Beaumont. <laughs> right, for you, Bill, it's the picture board. Pick a number, please. Uh, number one, please, David. <laughs> right, Bill, so who is this? Uh, is it, uh, no, that's not right, no. <laughs> is it, uh, oh, let's have a look, let's have a look, uh, oh, yeah. 
Is it, uh, no, no. <laughs> eh? What? <laughs> what, you think it's, yeah, it might be, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Say it, say it, say it, well, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, oh, we think it's, what? What? <laughs> what, you think it's, yeah. <laughs> all right, yeah, yeah. Oh, say it, yeah. Right, uh, yeah, all right, yeah. <laughs> Well, Alex, Alex thinks it's Sue Barker. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> Alex thinks it's Sue Barker. Uh, John thinks it's Sharon Davis. But I'm sure it's Desert Orchid. <laughs> Yourself, Bill. He is, in fact, Lidford Christie. <laughs> Do you think Tyson is invincible? Well, I hope not, because if I can't see him, how the bloody hell am I going to eat Raised a lot of smiles We'll tell our friends tomorrow We were rolling in the aisles We've shared each other's company And in a little way It weren't too bad an ending To a weary kind of day Millions never noticed Millions never knew If we're really honest It was only me I suppose our contribution to the world tonight was small Compared to oh so many things, it wasn't much at all Against the burning issues that make the world go round Compared to those we never even lifted off the ground Every puppy falls for us tonight Every puppy falling in the royal door Every piece of concrete knocked down from the Berlin Wall Every five pound note that doesn't grow on trees Every freedom fighter that was brought down to his knees Compared to all so many things it was and worth the lives But in a way I have to say I think we did all right Compared to all oh, so many things It wasn't worth a lot But in a way I think there was A place for us tonight Thank you.
See you next time. Bye-bye.